Um, so I'll let uh, maybe Rachel, if you want to start by presenting yourself and introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about what you do. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'm Rachel. Um, I work for Sustain and there I'm the local food retail coordinator. So my job is to find ways to help grow the local and sustainable food movement um, in order to increase UK food resilience, create sort of fairer economic, uh, fairer distribution of the economic benefits of food and help with the transition to more sustainable food systems as well. Um, I've been in the job about six months. Um, Prior to that, I worked for 10 years in a sustainability communications agency called Futera, where I worked with lots of different um, organisations to help them talk about sustainability in a way that makes it simple, relevant and exciting to a wide range of different audiences while avoiding the pitfalls of greenwash and green hush. Um, and so I work with sort of big brands like Tommy Hilfiger and Cla Calvin Klein, as well as with NGOs like um, the Wildlife Trusts and the Nature Conservancy in the US as well. Sort of on top of that, for the last five years, I've also been working part time as an organic grower. Um, and uh, last year, I actually worked full time as a grower, as the head grower at Sitopia Farm in the London Borough of Greenwich on a maternity cover role. Um, and there I was responsible for bringing in the sales, marketing, you know, shifting, shifting uh, produce. And so I have some idea of what it's like to actually be on the ground and selling this stuff and trying to make the marketing side of that work. Um, so that's me. Um, Julia, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi. So I'm Julia from Better Food Traders. And so we are a UK wide network for ethical food traders, um, many of whom use OFN as, as their platform. Um, essentially, anyone who's um, trading in food that is grown organically and, um, you know, traded fairly, but essentially traded in a kind of short supply chain uh, model, then um, they can join our network and we offer business support and advice and training. Um, and we also do sort of policy and advocacy and some public campaigns as well. So a whole kind of blend of things. Um, but yeah, I was also a trader previously. So I ran a, a, a food shop in North London and did all the sort of marketing and comms there. So um, I've kind of got that, yeah, that first hand experience as well of reaching out to customers and trying to find the right messages and the right ways to connect. Thank you, Julia. Um, okay, so the next question uh, was, what do you think are the best ways to promote sustainable food? Because marketing is quite, is quite tough in that kind of sector I think because you don't want to say the wrong thing or and you want to make sure that people understand who you are as an organization uh, but also convince them and I was wondering what you thought were the best ways maybe Rachel yeah I mean I I actually have some slides which um, I'd like to share because it's not a straightforward question um, there's a lot <laughs> that question um, yeah. I want to make sure I do it justice if that's okay so I'll just um, share my screen um, so can you all see that yes you can great yeah so the question you sort of posed to us initially was what's the most important thing to put forward when it comes to promoting sustainable food and my answer to that rather frustratingly is there is no one thing. Um, it's a matter of strategy. So I'd love to be able to say there is a silver bullet um, and here's the one thing that you can say to win everybody over, but in my opinion, it doesn't exist. Um, so what I, I would like to talk about is some of the, the tools and approaches that I have sort of gained and, and gleaned over the years in order to, um, sort of figure out what to say how do you decide what your messaging is and hopefully that can give everybody some new ideas perhaps on how to approach the topic um so i think the main challenge when it comes to sustainable food is a nice challenge to have which is there are so many benefits of sustainable food there are so many ways of talking about it so many different things we could say and that the challenge becomes it becomes really hard to know what to choose so you know 
we can say things like climate friendly, fair, nutritious, good for wildlife, helps biodiversity, tasty, healthy, just, you know, provides local jobs. There are so many different ways of talking about this. So how do we navigate this? And um, for me, it really comes down to audience because which of these benefits you'll pull out depends entirely on who you're talking to and what matters to them. And conventional communications wisdom says, really the best thing to do is not try and speak to everybody, but try and pick a target audience, find out what matters to them, focus your messaging on that, um, and you're far more likely to have success with that audience than you it would if you were trying to speak to everybody and please everybody. However, the, the challenge I think in this sector becomes how do you know who your audience is and what matters to them? So I'm gonna share a tool that I have used in these sorts of situations over the years that I have found really helpful and I hope you will too. And it's basically an audience segmentation tool that looks like this. Um, and this uh, was created by an organization called Cultural Dynamics. Um, and this segmentation is called the Values Modes. And Cultural Dynamics are academics and social psychologists. You can go on their website and find all, of, all about this uh, segmentation tool, including which group, audience group you might belong to. Um, and the reason I really like this one, the reason I think it's good is that it's based on values. Um, so there are lots of different audience segmentation tools around, some based on demographics, some based on life stage, some based on other factors, but this one's based on values. And the reason that I think that's good here is that it's your values that are most likely to dictate how you respond to sustainability messaging far more than anything, you know, demographic, your age, your ethnicity, your gender, anything like that. It's far more likely that you'll, you'll respond um, based on your values when it comes to the sustainability issue. So I'll just talk through the different groups. So at the bottom there, we've got what we're calling the green pioneers. And I would say there's three sort of main groups, but there's actually 12 subgroups, but I won't go into that level of detail, but that's all on their website. So the green pioneers uh, are the people that are most motivated by ethics, by innovation, by activism, and by novelty, so newness. And this group tend to love big change. They're big picture thinkers. And um, yeah, they're really into, you know, um, yeah, sort of big, big change in systemic thinking. So we tend to find a lot of people within our movement kind of sit in this group. Um, then sort of just round from that, we've got what we're calling the brick settlers. So these are sort of broadly an audience group that are most motivated by things like belonging, security, family, community, um, almost in complete opposition to the green pioneers. They're not such a fan of change. Um, they're very interested and motivated by what's going on in their community, their locality and on their doorstep. So um, these two groups can often butt heads. So the green pioneers might say, um, to the brick settlers, how can you care about dog mess on the street when there's climate change happening? And the brick settlers might say back, well, how can you care about climate change when there's dog mess on your street? Um, and it's not that one or other group cares more about environmental issues, it's just that they're coming at it from a, di a different angle completely. Then we have the gold prospectors. So these are um, the group most motivated by success, by esteem, by fun, by visibility. And this group tends to make up, um, and you can again find this on the Culture Dynamics website, the breakdowns in different countries of what percentage of each of these groups um, a population sort of has. And in the UK, the gold prospectors make up the biggest uh, proportion of the UK population. Um, and then it's next the brick, brick settlers, and then the green pioneers is actually the smallest group. Um, so, so that's sort of an overview of the different groups. So what does this mean for how we might talk to the different groups about sustainability messaging? Well, do, yeah, the benefits that you sort of pull out depend on which of these different groups you're talking to. And I think sort of based on what we know they're motivated around, you can kind of get a sense of what are the sort of benefits of sustainable food we might talk to them about specifically or might particularly appeal to that group. 
So um, when it comes to the green pioneers, um, they, they, they're big systems thinkers, they like the big picture, they like change. So things like the climate, the biodiversity and the sort of broader social benefits can really appeal here, as well as the novelty benefits. So they love exploration and new things. So different varieties of food, trying new flavors, trying new recipes, all of that sort of thing. Then when it comes to the gold prospectors, this is where the personal benefits can really come into play. So things like quality, taste, nutrition, how is it making my life better? How is it making me more uh, successful or held in higher regard or helps make my life better as well as the status benefits as well. So are, is this food being used by high end chefs? Um, is there sort of social proof around it? Um, all of that sort of thing. And then on the brick settler side, probably more motivated by the security benefits around food resilience, self-sufficiency, independence, sovereignty, that sort of thing, as well as community benefits. So fairness, local jobs, local economy, togetherness, all of that sort of thing. That's not to say these are discrete and, you know, certain bits of this, I think particularly the personal benefits can be something that, that really do speak across the groups, but actually just looking at how you might tailor um, the different messages to these different groups. So the question then becomes, okay, that's fine, but how do I know which of these groups I'm talking to? And again, that comes down to a matter of strategy. So it depends um, in what context you're operating. So what we tend to find, I think, in this movement, that the green pioneers are the low hanging fruit. They're the people that are probably already buying from you um, because they're the ones that sort of most quickly and easily get it, I suppose. Um, and also the movement itself is more likely to be made up of people from that group and therefore we're more likely to talk in ways that already resonate with that group naturally. Um, but the goal prospectors, I think, represent the biggest growth area. They're the people for whom I think there are loads of benefits of sustainable food that can very easily appeal. They're the ones that are more likely to um, be up for spending a little bit more money. And also, that, yeah, as we know, they represent the biggest group. So huge growth area there. But the brick settlers are also reachable if we can speak their language a little bit more. And my feeling is, my sense is, we tend to focus a bit too much on that green pioneer group and less on the other two groups. And actually those could really be growth areas, but it depends entirely on where you live. So what are the different strategies? So I think, again, this entirely depends on your context. So you might say, well, actually, I live in an area that I really think over indexes for green pioneers. Um, and actually, so it makes most sense for me to focus on that group and tailor that messaging to that group. Or you might say, actually, I've got most of the green pioneers in my area. I want to focus on the gold prospectors and bringing them in next so that we can reach a new audience and, and, and achieve growth that way. Or you might say, actually, in my area, there's just loads of brick settlers. And that's, you know, that's where we need to focus our messaging. Or you might say, I can't possibly just focus on one group um, because, you know, it's not going to be that simple. So, for example, you might want to take two groups, the green pioneers and the gold prospectors, and say, I'm going to actually focus on messaging that's sort of the intersection between those two. For example, clim climate friendly food that tastes out of this world or something like that. How, you know, can you bring together and focus on, on where those two might overlap? Um, or you might say, actually, I'm going to focus on all three, but sort of discreetly in my area. So when I go to, and this is probably the tactic we've most adopted with Zootopia Farm. So if we're gonna go and do a talk to a local Friends of the Earth group, we might adopt messaging that more appeals to the green pioneers. If we're gonna go and do a stand in a shopping center, we might adopt messaging that most appeals to the gold prospectors. Of course, you're making assumptions, um, but it's just sort of starting to think strategically about who, who do we need in order to bring more customers in to sell more and all of that? And so, and and what might um, be the right messaging in the right context with the right people? Um, so that's tended to be, this is how, you know, I've used this tool in lots of different scenarios um, and, it, and it tends to have worked for me, sort of trying to make sense of, of what's going on in a particular situation. So I guess my first, point of you know how do you promote sustainable food i would say decide who your target audience is and try and leverage the benefits that are most likely to appeal to them and related to that and and the audience is always the first place i would i would start and always where i'd begin 
But related to that, I think my second point is don't try and say it all at once. Um, I think there can be a tendency, again, because there are so many benefits, is to throw out a ton of different messaging sort of right up front um, to try and tick every box and appeal to everybody. But I had a, a, a creative director in my previous job who said something to me that really stuck with me. He's like, if I throw, if I have one ping pong ball and I throw it at you, you're likely to catch one ping pong ball. If I have five ping pong balls and I throw them to you all at once, you're likely to catch no ping pong balls. And that for me is a really good metaphor for messaging and actually how so, uh, quite often less is more. Um, and also related to this is you have a whole customer journey. So you have, you know, you don't just have one interaction with a customer in that quite often, so we've got this customer, this is sort of a very basic customer journey. So no trust, buy, stay, share in that. So the no phase is where people will encounter you for the first time. That could be on socials, that could be uh, at a market, sort of anywhere. Um, and then they sort of go into the consideration phase where they're figuring out whether to buy from you. Then there's the point of purchase around buy. Then there's the post purchase experience. So and, and whether they come back and then hopefully they do come back and then sort of become advocates and share and talk about what you're doing. And so um, you have a lot of different places where you can put lots of different messaging. And so you can think about how you might use different messaging um, different messages along that consumer journey, along that customer journey. And this graph here is actually a piece of um, research that I did with a brand a few years ago, where we actually did loads of A-B testing to figure out um, where does sustainability add most value along the customer journey? So we tested out different messaging with and without sustainability in it at different points all along the, you know, the socials, the web, the every, you know, through that whole customer journey. And what we found was that at the beginning, at that awareness phase, it was really great and useful to pull people in and attract attention. But that's particularly because this company was operating in an area where there wasn't much of a sustainability offering. So this was really different and unique. Then when it came into the, actually the consideration phase and people were deciding whether to, to buy from you, uh, buy the product, sustainability dropped right down in importance. What mattered much more, this was a food product, was taste, was nutrition, was convenience of purchase, all those other things, not necessarily the sustainability. So there wasn't that much value in really pushing the sustainability messaging at that point. It was much more the other factors, the other purchase considerations that mattered there. Then in the post-purchase phase, sustainability became really important again because it made people feel really good about the product that they bought and, and made them more likely to come back and also was the main reason they would advocate for the product as well. So basically just to say there's a whole user journey and think about the different benefits and, and which ones might make sense to talk about in different places. You don't have to say everything up front all at once. There's lots of different places that you can put your different messages across if you feel you need to hit different things. And sustainability certainly won't be the most important thing all the way along. Um, that said, this graph will look different for different products and different, um, different brands. This was just an example of this one. And the th my, my sort of third point is around investing in photography. Messaging matters enormously, but definitely a picture tells a thousand words. And I think this is something um, that is so, so crucial because the one thing that I think is so true of sustainable food and of the moon is that it's top quality. The food is so good. It tastes so much better so often than the food you can buy in the supermarkets. But if our photography isn't selling that, isn't doing that justice, then um, we, we're, we're losing out on putting across one of the most key benefits that we really have. Um, so Piper's Farm is a farm that I think does it really, really well. Um, and I would say, I know this can cost money, but if you do have any budget, this is where I would spend it. I really think it pays dividends and it just really helps people connect in a way, no matter which of those groups they're in, we're all buying a product to put in our bodies. And if it doesn't look fantastic, that can be a real barrier. So it is the one place that I would, you know, spend and certainly where we found it's really paid off um at Zootopia farm as well um we've invested quite a bit there um not that we have big budgets at all we absolutely don't um but uh yeah so this is especially if you know we do want to target that goal group and move into that area we really need it uh, you know the produce to be looking its best 
I do have some other top tips, but I'm not going to go into them in depth. So there's number one, two, and three. Um, uh, create social proof so people attract people. The more we can show that people are buying this produce and we've got satisfied customers and putting that across, that always helps. Um, another thing we've really found at Zootopia Farm, get out into your community. So, you know, we made the mistake for a long time of making the assumption that people in the communities around us knew we were there and they absolutely didn't. And the only way we could get around that was by getting out into the community, but that doesn't have to be a really time consuming thing. We found Facebook groups invaluable um, as you know, just a few posts in Facebook groups have enabled us to reach an enormous amount of, um, of people. Every time we do a big hit, on the Facebook groups, our web traffic absolutely spikes and we get more people coming to our, our monthly pop-up market. Um, that has been something we've experienced sort of far more, it was far more valuable than any paid social activity, just posting in those local community groups. Um, and then being really human on socials as well. So talking about, um, you know, all the things that supermarkets can't say about what it's like to be um, a trader um, and doing this as, you know, uh, not a big supermarket. It really helps us stand out and show what can we do that actually the supermarkets, they can't do. They can't be telling these human stories on the ground in the same way we can. Um, and that can really help connect people to what you're doing. Um, so those, you know, I don't want to take up any more time, um, but that those are my top tips, I suppose, or the top do's. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll stop sharing and, and pass the mic to Julia. Thank you. Oh, or maybe Janai, if you want to step in, but um, I suppose I just wanted to respond to that actually, Rachel, because um, I think it absolutely echoes yeah, what I experienced when I was a trader and also the sorts of things that we glean across the Best Food Traders Network. You know, I think what Rachel's just presented is absolutely correct. Um, and I just wanted to add in a couple of other thoughts. One is um, a very sort of broad brush comment, but that there's interesting research about the generational differences and how um, younger people in general are beginning to just expect sustainability to build it, be built into products and services as a given. Um, and they're starting to kind of really expect that on everything and, and be wanting to see sustainability coming through in the messaging of any product they buy. I think you do get the risk of sort of greenwashing and people um, buying into messages that may not be necessarily correct, but it's I suppose it's just a generational thing that young people really just want to see some sort of green credentials in everything they buy. Whereas for um, older people, and again, this is very broad brush, but older people tend to see sustainability more as a co-benefit, which I think ties into the sort of um, the gold prospectors group where um, sustainability is great as long as it's a co-benefit as long as alongside it's really tasty and flavorsome or it's really nutritious, it's really good for me and my kids. So um, sort of depending slightly on age groups, you, you also might want to just think about that, about what's the, you know, how do you make that a, a co-benefit when actually the something that's kind of intrinsic to the product or intrinsic to how it benefits the customer is going to be what you kind of lead on. Um, and I was also just going to flag something that uh, you may be aware of, Rachel, where Piper's farm worked with the Soil Association on some A-B testing and some kind of web testing. And they found that with one particular web page where they put their Soil Association logo, and they also had this very clear form of words. And I um, I really just thought of it, so I haven't got it to hand, but I can probably kind of dig it out while we, while we continue to talk. But it was something like, um, you know, organic means uh, good for the soil, good for biodiversity and good for health or some very sort of short little statement, a sort of tagline, which they put next to that logo. And on every page of their website where that was there, they found a 15% uplift in purchases. And it was almost like just having that, um, that very succinct, direct message next to every product just made it easier for people to kind of, um, you know, get that message very succinctly and I do I think there's also you know there is a role um therefore in logos and marks and that, the sort of trust that is built by that as well it's kind of a shorthand that people are beginning to be more conscious of um Janai do you want to kind of 
Um, now I'm just trying to be mindful of the time. I was wondering if you wanted to share your slides as well. I can do. I mean, actually, Rachel does such an amazing job, and I'm not. I, I'm just thinking what I can. Um, I think I'll skip through some of the things that I was going to say. Um, let me just have a very quick look at. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I can share. Let's let's share, and let's just see how we go. Um, I'll talk through a couple of these points, but I think Rachel's also covered a lot. Um, and this is actually, I mean, these were some slides that I um, produced for somebody else. Should I make this bigger? Sorry, let's do this as I change using my random tabs. Um, this was aimed at a, a group of food producers and uh, sorry, producers and sort of um, product designers. So I suppose it's it's sort of speaking slightly beyond just um, the growers, but people where you know you're a food and drinks business, but you may have sustainability built into your business in a different way. So I think one of the things that really useful to think about is what is your sustainability USP. So. Is it that it's inherent in the products or services you offer? Um, you know, in terms of, you know, if you're a grower, how you grow, um, how, you know, short supply chains, that sort of thing. Or is it that sustainability is actually shaping your business model? Um, maybe you're, uh, like we've got a local kombucha um, brewer who has a circular model so that he only, he delivers in glass bottles and he has a return system. So his whole model is built on this kind of circular use of packaging and sort of, and also on having a subscription service so that he kind of keeps his customers. So is it part of your actual business model or is sustainability embedded in your company culture and vision? So is it more to do with how you're treating your staff or sourcing your produce or, um, you know, some sort of vision around how you want to see your, um, your vehicles and your packaging or your model work in a sustainable way. So I think it's really important to identify what, what that sustainability USP is so that you can talk about it. Um, and then uh, it's also about knowing your impact. So I think when you get to the point where you want to be talking specifically about sustainability, I think taking Rachel's points that sometimes you just want to be talking about products or you want to be talking about other, other messaging. But at the point where you want to talk about sustainability, um, to really understand what your impact is and what differences that you're making, uh, you know, that's really important. And I think that's also important in terms of the kind of greenwashing or green hushing. But, you know, like actually being able to tell a clear and sort of evidence story about the difference that you're making, I think it's really important. So to be thinking about how you capture that impact. Um, and then this sort of echoes what Rachel was saying, so I probably won't go into that too much. And again, market research, I suppose just to say the very obvious that um, understanding your customer, it can be a combination of market research. That's where you're looking at the broader market and identifying where your business sits in that market. And then customer research, where you dig into your customers and you try and understand um, those different demographics that you're serving and their different interests and values. And as Rachel said, that's that's where you can then think strategically about what messages are going to move what audience and that, you know, you will have different audiences for sure. Um, and also what marketing channels are going to reach those audiences. Um, you know, we kind of all know Facebook is really the land of people like me, <laughs> parents, mums, older people. Um, Instagram is the realm of the slightly younger people. I won't even go into TikTok. I don't even use it. Um, like, you know, are you in a place where leaflets are going to be really um, cost effective and a good way to sort of directly reach people? Or are you better off branding up all your vans and doing some kind of out of home kind of thing so it's it's like what are those channels that are actually going to get in front of those audiences and then also connect with them in a meaningful way that they kind of go oh right yeah like I notice that I'm, I'm I'm listening to that um 
And then I've got some other slides that are more about, I suppose, the, the ins and outs of it. So maybe I will leave that for now and we can go back to uh, stop sharing. But yes, well, I'm happy to talk about, um, I suppose, like language and ways of telling stories as well. Thank you. That was both of you. It's very interesting. Um, I was wondering, maybe we can start with questions, because since Anthony's not here, then I think if anyone has questions and then it can maybe become a bit of a conversation. Um, but if you. Oh, Jenny. We can't hear you. Do you want to type it in the chat? Or oh, that's what you're doing. <laughs> okay. Does anyone else have a question? I have a um a question really. Mine is a bit more about the um, some of the people obviously I've been talking to lots of different people and different enterprises, but one of the things that um a lot of them wanted to do was educate. Um, now I'm in Telford and Rekin, which is a very built up area. Um, we've got lots of younger food enterprises, like little restaurants, pop ups in uh, markets and things who are wanting to educate um, because they're targeting a customer that doesn't even think about sustainability being um, something that they would think about. So how what sort of language, I suppose, would you use to educate? So they're all doing things themselves from a because they're value driven it's something that they believe in how do they then target those people um who don't even consider it when they're shopping why would you buy from the local um market grocers rather than pop across the road to the little aldi so what they're trying to do is sort of educate in that way and it's i just think it's a, quite a different <laughs> sort of kettle of fish isn't it really it is different. Um, I mean, I can say a couple of words on that. Um, just thinking of one interesting campaign that's running at the moment, actually, it's being run by Re London, who are the sort of cross London borough mm -hmm. organisations. You're nodding. I think, do you know about this campaign? No, already? no, but I'm going there. I'm thinking. Okay, so what they realised is that, um, it's just a little example, but they realised that actually a, a challenge they wanted to tackle in all London boroughs was the amount of waste that the council was having to collect, household waste. And they realised a really large part of that household waste was food waste. And then they did some really good um, research to look at which households were creating the worst of it. And it sort of, I suppose, unsurprisingly, it's often families with young kids or busy households where people aren't able to sort of manage their food buying. Um, and also younger people who's, who are often a bit less savvy about you know recooking things or you know finding ways to repurpose food and so they've created a campaign which is called eat like a londoner but the way they've actually delivered it is through lots of quite fun aspirational content um lots of it is video content and lots of it is about um how to eat like a londoner like how to save money like a londoner is to uh, use your vegetable scraps to make stock and then freeze it into ice cubes, for example. So instead of going at it really head on and feeling that they have to educate people about food waste and say, don't put it in the bin, they've turned it into a kind of an educational process, but also an aspirational process so that people are kind of learning. They feel like they're being given tips and life hacks on how to save money. They feel like they're being given great recipes from some of their favorite influencers and chefs. Um, and so they've just, I feel like they've executed it in a really clever way. So it doesn't feel like education. So I would kind of give that as an example that you, you that people might say they want to do education, but I think you need to think of it in a different way. You need to think, what can I serve? What can I, what can I give people that is actually engaging content? What, yeah. what will slightly, you know, disrupt the narrative um, 
without going at it really head on necessarily. Um, yeah. I think you can. I think if you want to be really bold, some organisations will, and they would, you know, say, "Did you know the supermarkets are responsible for you know X amount of food waste and X amount of damage and da da da?" So you could be very aggressive, but I think that feels a bit campaigny, and you're only going to get to that, um, you know, the sort of the green triangle on on Rachel's circle. <laughs> you know, um, you're going to put a lot of people off. So yeah. yeah. I would I would 100% agree. I, I tend to shy away from thinking of education and more as positioning in that if you're trying to reach, you, what, what that says to me is, you, yeah, you don't have that Green Pioneer audience and trying to turn them into Green Pioneers is just not going to work. Um, and instead, what you need, yeah, what I would do is try and understand the audience you've got. And the brilliant thing about sustainable food is there's so many benefits that have nothing to do with sustainability, like environmental sustainability. Um, finding out what matters to that audience and how can we position what we have in a way that appeals to them, is aspirational, is exciting, is relevant, it would be yeah my inclination of the path it, the path of least resistance I suppose yeah I think my choice my choice of the word education probably wasn't correct either but um yeah it was it was sort of the benefits of buying local and growing and everything else um to, to coincide with the with the very tight budgets and it's I suppose it's just reframing isn't it um the language <laughs> Yeah, so. I mean, what I found as well as a trader, um, I mean, we were in North London, and so you've got a very kind of mixed and metropolitan group of people living. Um, it was in sort of Crouch End in mm -hmm. um, Hackney, Tottenham kind of area. But um, actually, the idea of local appeals is such a sort of cross-cutting value, and particularly for the, um, I can't remember what the term was, the brick, the brick people. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know those people that are more motivated by security and family and that sort of thing local and community is a really powerful value that kind of works for, for most people and the novelty of being able to buy you know for my customers the novelty of being able to buy honey that was from a beekeeper that was a quarter of a mile away in basically in central London um, or the novelty of being able to buy produce from a city farm like up in Enfield you know I think people when they can sort of um find a bit of novelty but find a bit of connection so that they see that food as coming from a place that they identify with that is part of their community and um part of their culture and their heritage and their memories um you know that that can be a good way to to sort of pull people in and then maybe you can make those stories. Um, I was also talking to, so I met recently a really interesting company who were basically, they they had orchards in Kent with, I'm based down in Canterbury and they had orchards for years. It was a kind of, you know, generational business. And they realized that they were just, you know, as many fruit growers, they were just really struggling financially. So they've decided to create a whole load of different new products and some of them are juices and some of them are, I think they're kind of like alcoholic things and all sorts of different products. Um, but they, what they've done with their, their branding is they've sort of, they've been able to marry this idea of like innovation, but also heritage and the kind of local story of we're Kentish apple growers. You know, this is this is in our blood. We've done it for centuries, maybe not centuries, but you know, and but layering on top of that, this idea of kind of innovation and a kind of new and exciting product. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if that necessarily answers your question, but it's sort of different approaches to try and chime with those values that people actually really get. I, I love that 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 thing about identity as well. The, you know, especially if we're talking about local food again, that's so powerful. Like, you know, this is you know our identity as London, as Yorkshire, as you know wherever. I think it's yeah, it's a, uh, not something we've necessarily yeah leveraged um, in the movement perhaps enough, and and yeah, we could really do more. Yes, Jenny, I don't, we still can't hear you. Do, 
Do you want to just type your question in in the chat? Unless it's a very long one. Um, but whilst you type, uh, I think it was really interesting as well, this idea of identity. And I live in, in, in Peckham uh, at the moment, and there's so much diversity and a lot of people are seeking for food that reminds them of home. Um, and especially like there's a big Caribbean community here. Um, and there there is a, a, a city farm down south and collective co called the Coco Collective. And they've been doing a lot, not that I want to use the word educational again, but they, they are trying to make the young people from their community gain more interest in buying local and growing your own food or caring about where your food comes from. Um, and I think that the way that they've really uh, underlined this idea of community was really, really interesting. I like community and identity and like, to reconnect with who you are as a London as a person in London that's not necessarily from London. Um, yeah, a hundred percent. I've um I was meeting someone recently who she actually works in Hastings, but she works with a lot of um racialized communities and just a very, very diverse customer base. And she said actually, you know, she sells entirely organically produced produce and a lot of it they actually grow themselves on a small halting. But that's not really what her customers come for. They come because they go, do you know what? This tomato, it tastes like home. It tastes like what it's meant to taste like. It's so flavorsome. And so this idea that you can give people food that actually tastes how it should, doesn't taste rubbish and plastic and fake. It tastes, you know, it's got real flavor. It's been grown in soil. I think, you know, I think, yeah, we're, we're often very, like keen to sort of um I don't know like talk about sustainability when actually there's just so many other benefits there's so many other things that that people will be motivated by yeah I I completely agree and we've got uh, at Satopia Farm last year our strawberries taste like nothing else and I really wanted to I just never got around to it which is related to Jenny's question actually um is uh, do a little video, like a taste test of Zootopia strawberries versus supermarket strawberries and just people's reactions as they taste one and the other. And actually, I think it is that flavour is just what this food really has going for it. And um, yeah, that's something that I think, yeah, that can be so cross cutting across those different groups because we're all eating the food and we all want to eat delicious. So if there is something that is really cross cutting across the different groups, I think it, it's probably that. Um, and it would be yeah it'd be great to to do more on that definitely but I just see yeah Jenny's posted a question I don't know um and I think it's a really important one um shall, shall I read it out or I don't want to take it or do you oh, want to read it, out? it, it, it. <laughs> yeah so one of the things we encounter is that there is some expertise in the organizations to be able to get the messaging out but not the capacity everyone is so busy doing the rest of the work it's always a way marketing and training goes out of the window when things are tight but they are the things we really need to focus on if we're to survive. And I can com I completely hear you. This was exactly the issue I had on the farm last year. Um, and it's only now that the head grower of Zootopia Farm is back and my involvement is purely on that, that we've started to see the sales increase because it was just so difficult otherwise. And I'd like to say on this matter, I haven't, again, I haven't got any quick wins on this. However, the work I'm doing at Sustain, so Sustain is the Alliance for Better Food and Farming, and um, my work is uh, to come up with a growth plan for local food, and we're looking across the infrastructure, and this is sort of a national level growth plan, looking across infrastructure at re the retail environment itself, and then with consumers as well. And on that consumer piece, we're very aware that the marketing of, of this local sustainable food at that local level is a real challenge, and the capacity is a real challenge. So part of what I really want the growth plan to look at is how do we help everyone overcome these barriers of capacity? 
therapy because there is training available there are webinars like this available but it comes down to doing the do and having the time to do it and having you know the photographer to do it and you know I do think we need some web builders and we need all of that and uh, funders won't fund the time for marketing I mean, that's the barrier we have to try and overcome, I think. And that's something that's really important to me. And I'd love, um, I, I, I mean, if, if this is something you're experiencing, I'd love you to feed into the growth plan because we're in the stage where we're starting to collect evidence and starting to say that actually this is really where we need to focus. And I, it's something that's very close to my heart. And, I, you know, it's the pull. It's the pull that we need to make all of this because I know I'm going to have a conversation with retailers and they're going to say to me, where's the consumer demand? And it's the marketing that we need to do that. So for me, it's so important to making this whole thing work. Um, so uh, please do. I tell you what, I'm going to put my email address in here. And if you would like to give evidence in the growth plan on this topic, I would love to hear from you. Um, I know that's not an easy fix uh, thing. And um, I just <laughs> would like to jump in and also just say that... Um, Better food traders, we are very conscious that this is a big part of the, the the sort of gap that people don't have time for. So a lot of our training focuses on marketing, kind of um, some of it is like very simple, basic introductory stuff. And then some of it actually is quite, we're, you know, we're offering some quite um, advanced or sophisticated training as well for people that have got a bit further. And we're also hearing our members loud and clear that they would really like bits of content or assets or things that we can create that they can just then repurpose so that we've kind of done half that work for them and so we we have got a certain number of different assets and um things that we we give to our membership and Tamar you are members so I'm pretty sure that um <laughs> you should be able to access some of that Jenny um but yeah, like we're really, you know, we really want to do what we can at the kind of, you know, just the the gritty level of doing it. And then um, we're also feeding into Rachel's work to see what we can do to come up with a kind of a, I think almost like a national campaign or something. I think we feel like there just has to be, um, has to be a, a proper a budget and a piece of marketing that actually just counters the juggernaut of the supermarkets. And you just think what the budgets are that they have. And we need to do something that really, um, you know, really, really counters that. I, I sort of feel like things like what the milk board did for kind of getting milk into schools and into everyone's diet, it, we need that. It needs to almost be like a big cultural shift. Um, so I can't promise that will be quick, Rachel, but I think we're both very keen to try and see what we can make happen over the next couple of years. Really. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm feeling very ambitious in this area and because I've come from agency land and I know how quickly these things can be come up with and turned around, you know, a, a national level campaign to promote local sustainable, drive, local sustainable food, drive people to the Better Food Traders website or, you know, another place that's pulling everything together. Um, I, I have seen there is money in the world. I've, I've witnessed it and it's just about getting it here that's what we need to do and um i yeah i would i would very much i'm i'm very keen to try and do something here jenny your question what about public procurement schools hospitals prisons we have some great research going on at uoe um i don't know if that does that come into your plan rachel the the it's more retail focused isn't it but I don't know if you yeah can... so 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 the plan that I'm working on I'm working on in conjunction with the Land Workers Alliance and um, some other organizations and our plan is one but I'm looking specifically at retail they the Land Workers Alliance are looking at public procurement yeah so um, that is part of it but it's not the part I'm doing um, mm. yeah and it's also to say that I think um, within the Better Food Traders Network, there are there are quite a few interesting kind of little examples of where members are beginning to make headway in local procurement. And some of it is quite small scale. And there's then there's things like the Courgette project that you've probably all heard of that was done in Wales. Um, you know, there are these little examples, um, but I think there's what we hopefully will get is just yeah these little examples start to add up to something 
bigger. And I think in that, we also need to work out how we talk to procurers um, just in the same way, in the same way that you market to customers, um, the general public, you need to think about how you market to those those larger buyers. So most of them are totally price driven for sure, but lots of them have got ESG targets or net zero targets or whatever. So how do you actually put your case forward? It's not just about can you supply it and can you supply it at a certain price? It's how can you actually help them achieve some of their other um, social goals that they will have written into their, you know, their business plans and their strategies. Um, also here down in Kent, the University of Kent has just become the first um, university in the world, I think, to be a right to food university. And they are doing lots of really interesting work around what that means. But one of the sort of interesting challenges for them is how do they then make their procurement mirror their kind of academic work and their sort of aspirations um and to you know some of it's about the right to food and the right to buy food at the right price but i think it's also about uh the right to buy food that is healthy and um good for the planet and fair to producers so i think all of those things are, are being done so there's yeah there's some interesting stuff to watch there as well at the university of kent Thank you. I feel like there was a lot of valuable things in this conversation. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? No. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I guess we can we can finish five minutes early, um, which I guess is good because it's already 7.30. So thank you everyone for coming. I know it's a bit late. Um, but we're trying out different times for events to see which ones are the most convenient. Um, but thank you to Julia and Rachel for, for joining today and sharing all of your expertise. Um, and hopefully I'll see everyone else soon in another event or anything related. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. I'm going to stop recording.